Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this CUBE clinic on Goldilocks. My name is Stevie. Um, and I am an uh, SRE uh, technical lead here at Fairwinds. And joining me today is Andy. Hi, everybody. I'm Andy, CTO of Fairwinds. Uh, I've got about five or six years of experience in Kubernetes. I've been with our company for four, and I just love all things open source and all things Kubernetes. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah. So uh, Andy and I work for Fairwinds. Um, and uh, here's our mission statement, which I'll read out loud here real quick. Uh, Fairwinds is a trusted partner for Kubernetes security, policy, and governance. With Fairwinds, customers ship cloud native applications faster, more cost effectively, and with less risk. We provide a unified view between dev, sec, and ops, removing friction between those teams with software that simplifies complexity. So there are two sides to our house. There's a side uh, where we manage Kubernetes clusters. Um, and so we've got a lot of experience. We've seen a lot of things uh, do doing that work. Uh, on the other side of our house um, is us using that experience to create a platform uh, that's backed by open source solutions and software that helps users gain visibility into the state of their clusters from a security governance and reliability stance and offers mitigation strategies for those challenges. Um, so, you know, I talked about, or I mentioned briefly that we use open source solutions uh, for that platform. One of the open source solutions that we use is Goldilocks, uh, which is a utility that can help you identify a starting point for resource requests and limits for your Kubernetes workloads. And so today, Andy is going to be uh, installing Goldilocks um, for us and showing us around the CLI, uh, showing us how it's installed, um, commands and how to interpret the uh, output that it shows us. And then we're also going to take a look at Goldilocks within the um, context of uh, that platform, which is called Insights. Uh, before we start, Andy, why did the uh, FBI not catch the hackers? I, I don't know. He ran somewhere. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's great. That's great. All right. So uh, what is Goldilocks? Uh, can you tell us a bit about the background? Can you tell us a bit about the name? Because Fairwind's open source stuff typically follows a convention of being space related. And this is not what I think of when I think Goldilocks. Yeah, definitely. So um, as Stevie mentioned, you know, we have managed a lot of clusters over the years for a lot of different customers. And we tell them, you know, we started out telling people, hey, you've got to set your resource requests and limits, because that's like fundamental to how we bin pack in Kubernetes, how we auto scale, all that good stuff. And, um, you know, fairly reasonable requests to ask our customers to do that. But then they came back to us and they said, well, what do we set them to? And so that usually ended up with us going into our monitoring solution and looking at graphs. And, you know, every time they wanted to size a workload, it would be kind of this process of, you know, just using your knowledge of Kubernetes to, to give them that recommendation. And I said, well, there's gotta be an easier way to do this because like, this is kind of painful and we get this ask all the time. Uh, and so what we did was we developed Goldilocks and um, we, uh, decided to leverage a different, uh, an existing recommendation engine that already existed in the Kubernetes community. So Goldilocks is based on the vertical pod autoscaler, and it basically manages vertical pod autoscaler objects in uh, what I call recommendation mode or what they call off mode, where the vertical pod autoscaler doesn't do anything. It just sits there and watches your pods and makes recommendations on resource requests and limits. And so Goldilocks is a nice way to manage all of those objects and then show everything in a nice dashboard. Uh, and then you mentioned the name. So we were trying to come up with a name uh, and obviously Goldilocks makes sense because you, know, you don't want your resource requests to be too low. You don't want to be too high. You want it to be just right. Um, and that plays into the space theme nicely as well, which not everybody may know. Um, the Goldilocks zone is the habitable zone um, in distance from a star. And so the Earth sits in what we term, what is nicknamed the Goldilocks zone, because it's not cold enough for water to freeze, but not so hot that humans can't live on that planet. And so it's a little bit of a dual meaning there. That's super cool. Okay. All right, uh, you want to get started with uh, the first part of the demo? 
Sure, sure. So if um, you're curious about Goldilocks, you want to try it out, it is on our GitHub page, fairwindsops slash Goldilocks. Um, if I could type correctly uh, our company name, that would be good. There we go. Uh, and so here you can find a link to our documentation site, which I just had shown. Um, you can find releases. And then uh, the documentation site will have instructions on how to install it. So if you're curious on doing, about doing this on your own, feel free to check that out. Uh, so I'm just gonna jump straight in here. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is we are going to kick off a kind cluster. So if you're not familiar with kind, that's uh, Kubernetes in Docker. So a nice way to run just a quick, easy test cluster on your machine. So if you wanna tinker around with Goldilocks, this is the easiest way to get started. And then as soon as that comes up, I'm gonna install a bunch of stuff. I'm gonna do the thing that I hate it when people do. I'm gonna copy paste a big old list of commands into my terminal here. Um, and I'm gonna run that. And so I'll, I'll put it over here on the left so I can talk about what's going on here. Uh, so the first thing, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say that's a lot of, uh... Uh, that's a big block of text. So yeah, if you'd walk us through that. Yeah, no problem. So there's a couple of prerequisites for running Goldilocks. The first one I already mentioned is the vertical pod autoscaler. Um, and so you have to have that installed before Goldilocks can do anything. So here, uh, Fairwinds has a chart for the vertical pod autoscaler. I don't believe there's an official upstream chart for it, which is why we have our own. Uh, and so you can install that from our repository. I'm putting it in its own namespace. Um, and then the other, the second prerequisite for Goldilocks and something that I kind of just install in all of my clusters and in my kind clusters as well is the metric server. So we have here the metric server chart with a couple of flags to make it work with uh, the kind cluster, specifically the kubelet insecure TLS flag. Um, and then I'm installing just a demo application. This is in our incubator chart repository. It's just a neat little app that you can hit and get traffic um, and, and show what pod you're connecting to. And then the last thing I'm doing obviously is installing Goldilocks itself. So we have a Helm chart for that. It's in the Fairwinds stable repository. That's at github.com slash Fairwinds ops slash charts if you want to see the source code for that. Um, and all of these instructions are should be in the uh, documentation for Goldilocks. Um, now, yeah. real quick, um, I do always want to make sure that you know we're not making assumptions about things. So can you just talk really quickly about what the vertical pod autoscaler does in general, like how on its own? Yeah, yeah, sure. So the ver so uh, if you're familiar with horizontal pod autoscaling, that is giving Kubernetes the ability to uh, create more replicas of a pod or less replicas of a pod based on some metric and some target. The vertical pod autoscaler looks at a pod's uh, CPU and memory usage and will scale it up and down in size. So it'll give it more CPU or less CPU or more memory or less memory. It does this in a couple of different ways, but the primary uh, way it can do that, um, well, essentially there's three parts. There's a recommender, which is the thing that watches all the pods and looks at the, uh, or watches all of the vertical pod autoscaler objects, which select pods much in the way that a horizontal pod autoscaler would, and then calculates a recommendation for those pods. And you'll see a little bit more of this later uh, as we go through the demo. And then um, it has an admission controller and an updater that will actually modify those pods requests as they get launched. And then I believe in some cases it will actually start replacing pods if necessary. We don't typically use it in update mode because it doesn't work with horizontal pod autoscalers that are scaling based on CPU and memory because the two would fight each other basically. Um, but we focus on the recommendation engine portion of it. Uh, in fact, the chart that we installed um, by default um, only installs the recommender and the updater and not the admission webhook because it's unnecessary. You can actually even have it just install the, the recommender if you want. Um, so those are all options on the chart. Cool, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So uh, we have some output here from the Goldilocks install, which uh, actually could probably use some updating um, because there's an easier way to do this. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a port forward to the Goldilocks dashboard service, 
which is now running in the uh, Goldilocks namespace. So we can see the controller and the dashboard are running. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and kick off that port forward. And we're going to open our browser and we're going to go to localhost 8080. The chart obviously has the ability to add an ingress or whatever if you want. We run these with an ingress and an OAuth proxy so that we uh, don't have to port forward to them. Um, and here we see nothing because we haven't done the next step yet. Um, <laughs> so the instructions are here about what you have to do next if you miss this part of the uh, installation instructions if you're going through the docs. But basically, Goldilocks doesn't operate on anything unless we tell it to. Uh, so we have to opt in to Goldilocks instead of opting out <coughs> but, uh, in the default installation. So we do this via labels. Um, so we can label our namespace with the goldilocks.fairwinds.com slash enabled equals true. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And if you'll recall, actually, um, we can see here that we also have no vertical pod autoscaler objects anywhere in the cluster because Goldilocks haven't created any yet. So what we'll do is we'll label our namespace demo with the goldilocks.fairwinds.com slash enabled equals true. And what we should see is Goldilocks immediately recognizes that, goes into a reconciliation loop and creates a vertical pod autoscaler for the deployment that exists in the Goldilocks namespace. So we are, sorry, the demo namespace. We see we have one deployment called demo basic demo and Goldilocks has created a VPA for that. You may have noticed that the CPU and memory were blank there for a second. Uh, and the provided was false. But now we see here, CPU and memory are filled out. So this is its recommendation for the pods running underneath this deployment. Uh, so we can get that VPA. Uh, just let me figure out the name. And we'll see that um, Goldilocks has created it to target the deployment demo, basic demo is off. So we're not going to try to automatically update anything. We're just going to sit here and watch. And then we'll see in the status, there's a recommendation here. So it's giving us four different uh, types of recommendations, um, a lower bound and an upper bound, which we will see sort of used in a second, and then a target. Um, and an uncapped target. I don't remember what uncapped target is. So I'm not going to go into that. But anyway, we see it has recommendations. Um, it has looked at the amount of CPU memory that it's using, and it has made a recommendation. Um, so if we do a top on those pods, we'll see they're actually using far less than this. That's because the VPA has a default minimum. And that's configurable if you want to set that minimum lower. But we're getting the default minimum recommendation here from VPA. Obviously, if we wanted to see real world numbers here, we would want to generate some load against this. So we can go back to our dashboard now and we can refresh and we see that there is a namespace listed here. Uh, and we can go ahead and click on that. And we will see, similar to what we were just looking at, we see, you know, we have a namespace demo that we've labeled. Um, it's got a deployment in it. That deployment has a single container in it. And here are our recommendations. We see it's recommending 15 millicores and 105 megabytes of RAM. You can drop that this down, get a little code box if you want to just copy that straight into your app. Um, and it will do this for every top level workload in the uh, namespace. So daemon sets, deployments, other things that create pods, stateful sets. Um, and you'll see those all listed here for this namespace. Or you can click on the detail all namespaces button over here and see all the namespaces all at once. Now, if you, um, oh, I'm sorry. So, so now you would get this recommendation from Goldilocks and you would decide to go and like make this change in your um, deployment, right? To change these settings. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so I could go and edit the YAML for it and then put that in and see how it performs. Uh, is kind of the idea here. And I, I would like to, you know, note that this is a baseline, right? This is a place to get started. We're looking at, you know, right now we're looking at about two minutes worth of information about how it's behaving. We're not generating any load against it. So 
you know, Goldilocks is only as good as the information you put into it. So it's a, it's a great baseline, good place to get started, can be really useful for that. And so right now, if you want to use Goldilocks for a workload, you would have to uh, label that, that namespace. So you would have to go through and label. What if you don't want to manually label all your namespaces one by one? How would you go about doing that? Ah, great question. So um, earlier we ran the, um, I think we did it over here, the Helm upgrade install Goldilocks create namespace from our Goldilocks chart. There are a couple of flags for both the controller and the dashboard. Um, they're both called on by default. Uh, and so basically that says, on, uh, show me all the namespaces unless I opt out of them. Uh, and so we can flip that flag for both the controller and the dashboard. Uh, and we'll do our Helm upgrade install. Uh, and I will, Edit the namespace demo and, or yeah, edit the demo namespace and remove that label. Um, and now we should see a whole bunch more VPAs. So we've got one for basically every top level workload in the cluster. And so this will actually give us a nice way to go back to our namespace list and see what this looks like when we have more than one namespace involved. I think my port forward probably died because I killed the pod. There we go. So now we see all the namespaces in the cluster. We can go take a look at the, I don't know, let's look at the Goldilocks namespace because we know it has more than one workload in it. And it probably hasn't populated yet. So we're going to give that a minute. No, there it is. All right. So now we see we've got two different deployments. They've got their own recommendations here. Um, and I think something I skipped over earlier, I didn't talk about quality of service. Um, if you're not familiar with quality of service in Kubernetes, it's a designation that's given to pods based on how their resource requests and limits are configured. Um, so guaranteed QoS is assigned when you have your resource requests and your limits equal to each other. And so you say, I... I need this much and I promise not to go over this much. Uh, and so it puts it into sort of a higher quality of service class because you've been very explicit about that. There's a burstable QoS as well, which is where you set your limits higher than your requests, um, which allows the pod to burst. This is important because scheduling and uh, scheduling is based on request and HPAs are also based on request. Uh, not on limit. And so you're allowed to burst over it, but if, if you start to do a lot of burstable things and they're all bursting all the time, then you're over-provisioned most likely, or you're, you're trying to use more resources than exist. And so we give a recommendation for either QoS class, um, and that's based on that um, uncapped, sorry, not uncapped target. This is based on the target. So we set both the resource request and limit to the target from the VPA. Burstable is set to the lower bound and the upper bound, I believe. It might be target and upper bound. I'd have to check the code on that. Um, but we give two different recommendations based on the information the VPA gives us. And if you ever forget all that QoS stuff, there's some helpful information down here and some links out to the Kubernetes documentation on those uh, quality of service classes. Nice, yeah. And you had said, I mean, you mentioned that, you know, it's only as good as the information you feed it, right? And mm -hmm. so um, with the information that the VPA is getting about the uh, resources being utilized from your workload, like um, how much data does the VPA uh, retain to make this, um, you know, like how far back does it go to make these uh, considerations? And what if I, you know, what if I wanted to go back even further than whatever the default is? Great question. Great question. So the vertical pod autoscaler by default um, can only take in so much historical data. Uh, I'm not sure what the actual timeline on that is. It's I think it's relatively short because it's storing the model in memory and the recommendation model in memory. Um, what you can do is the vertical pod autoscaler gives us the option to connect to Prometheus. Uh, so you can connect that VPA recommender to a Prometheus instance in your cluster. And then it's actually configurable how much time you want it to look back. Um, so you can kind of align your Prometheus retention settings with your VPA settings so that they're 
you know, somewhat um, sane, uh, you know, agreeing with each other, shall we say. Um, and so I can show how to do that here pretty quickly. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to add a Prometheus stack to this cluster. So I'm going to use the cube Prometheus stack, which is a public chart from the Prometheus community. Uh, and I'm going to disable Grafana and alert manager because I don't need it right now. But what this is going to do is it's going to install cube state metrics, which gets all of like the Kubernetes state information. It's going to install, um, a Prometheus instance and the Prometheus operator. Uh, and so that Prometheus will immediately start gathering information about the resources in my cluster. Uh, and so we'll get that installed. And then what we have to do is we have to update our vertical pod autoscaler installation. Um, so I'm going to find my VPA install command that I ran earlier, and I'm gonna add a few flags to that. So I'm gonna add the recommender.extraargs.prometheus address. And I'm gonna set that to the address pointing to the Prometheus service. So if we get pods or get services in the Prometheus namespace, we will see we have a service called cube Prometheus stack Prometheus in the Prometheus namespace on the 9090 port. And then we have to set one other flag on the recommender. Uh, this is documented in the VPA chart as well as lightly documented in the VPA project. Um, although sometimes I've had to go download or go look at the code where all the flags are defined for the uh, VPA recommender because they're not super well documented. So. Um, so we have to set the storage method for the VPA recommender to Prometheus. Uh, and so we can go ahead and take a look at the logs as that starts to take place. We should be getting a new recommender here in just a second. And now we should have, yep, um, historical usage query used container CPU seconds total from the C advisor job, which is default in the Prometheus installation. Uh, and so it's going to go just check all the, and the container memory working set bytes. So it's going to go get all that historical information and make its recommendations based on the Prometheus information there. So if we'd had Prometheus running for a little bit longer, I think the default on that flag is like 30 minutes, um, but I believe it can be configured to be longer. We can actually take a look real quick, if folks are curious. Go to the vertical pod autoscaler folder in the autoscaler repo. Uh, and we go to the recommender package and we go to I don't remember where the flags are exactly. Oh, I think it might just be in main.go actually. Here we go. Yep. Um, so we'll just search for Prometheus here. So we have that Prometheus address flag we set. If your Prometheus job is a little bit different, you're not using the defaults in the Q Prometheus stack. Um, and then when we start looking at storage, we have history length. So we'll go back eight days, uh, history res resolution, one hour, some timeout stuff. So there's a lot of different flags to configure here. Um, and this is probably the easiest place to see them all because I don't think they're fully documented. Um, and so the code's definitely the, the source of truth here. Would any of these, so I'm imagining a scenario where you have a workload that is, um, you know, sometimes is burst, just burst up over a limit, you know, for a short amount of time. So you just have a little mm -hmm. spike, right? That yep. can often be hidden or, or uh, can adversely affect, um, you know, the recommendation that you get. Are those uh, flags that we were looking at uh, in Prometheus, are those uh, some things that you could use to sort of sort the granularity there um, to account for those kinds of spikes? Good question. I'm not sure how it takes that into account. I'm guess well, probably the uh, resolution and the interval uh, together probably would affect that behavior. Um, 
I'm not entirely certain, you know, the deep nuance of that. I do know that, you know, once it has that information from Prometheus, we do see that encapsulated in this upper bound here. I've seen that upper bound go super high because the workload will spike up mm -hmm. and that will be encapsulated in that upper bound. As long as you're, like you said, your uh, resolution from Prometheus is high enough such that you're actually seeing that information from Prometheus. Right. Okay. Um, and so how does uh, Goldilocks actually populate all this data? Okay, good question, good question. So um, this dashboard uh, runs essentially the same as, as a CLI command that we have. Um, there's a summary command in Goldilocks. Um, so if we just do Goldilocks summary, we'll see it spits out this really large uh, um, JSON object. Um, and we can throw that into a file real quick and look at that via JQ. Uh, and so we see all of the VPA information for each workload summarized in this object. Uh, and so this is the data object that is provided to the dashboard uh, for each namespace. Um, and so, you know, if you wanted to get that data out some other way, or just, you know, you really like reading JSON for some reason, um, <laughs> you're welcome to try out that Goldilocks summary command. It's not fully supported because we don't really maintain the CLI functionality all that much. Uh, it's really there for testing, um, but it is definitely available and usable if folks need that data somewhere else or want to, you know, like Look at JSON or something. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to like import that as a dashboard or something like that, you could. That's probably possible. Right now, the dashboard doesn't actually. You know what? We might have put. I'll have to take a look. There may be an endpoint on the dashboard to be able to grab that JSON object directly without having to uh, run the summary command. But yeah, you could effectively do whatever you wanted with that JSON object. Yeah. So we've um, you know, we talked about installing Goldilocks in a cluster. We've talked about um, you know, how, to, how to label your namespaces so that um, you know, Goldilocks picks it up and, and creates the VPA objects in, uh, for it or uh, sources of those VPA objects. Um, and we've talked about um, getting our data retention to be longer so that we have more information to work off of. But we've done this, let's say, you know, in, in one cluster. If you have multiple clusters, so you've got like multiple production clusters, for example, that you might want this data in, um, how would you go about, is there a simpler way to run Goldilocks rather than having to port forward or <laughs> create ingresses for every different cluster? <laughs> Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, and this is that's really where our SaaS product comes into play, right? Um, our SaaS product will allow you to collate all of the information from a whole bunch of clusters into, um, into a single dashboard where we encapsulate that Goldilocks data. And then we actually take it a bit further and we add cost information and other things like that. So I can show you that real quick. Um, um, you know, obviously there is a, a pure open source option if you really want to run it everywhere and install it everywhere and grab that JSON and do something with it, but we've already done that for you here. Because uh, that's, that's exactly what we're doing here. So uh, this is Fairwinds Insights. Um, first, we'll see, you know, the, when we first see it, we see we've got a whole bunch of clusters listed here um, and they've got different scores and things. So not only do we pull in Goldilocks data, but we have a whole bunch of other open source that feeds into this. We've got Nova, we've got Pluto, we've got Polaris. We've got other people's uh, best of breed open source, like uh, Trivi from Aquasec. All of that's in here. And so you get a lot more than just efficiency and cost. But we're going to focus on that because we're talking about Goldilocks today. Um, so here we see on the efficiency tab, we've got, uh, we first see a cluster comparison where we get these cool little box charts that show us what's our available capacity, what's our CPU requests, what's our CPU limits, and how much of that are we actually using? We can see here our utilization is actually far lower than our requests and our limits. Um, so this is a little bit more detailed view than what Goldilocks gives you uh, into that. And then we can also view memory as well, not just CPU, because obviously there's two sides to this story. 
And then if you, um, you can either put in just a kind of a rough cost per node that you think you have for your cluster and we'll calculate these cost estimates or you can um, pull in your AWS billing data into this and actually get a direct correlation to your CPU and memory costs uh, calculated for each cluster over time. Uh, and so we can see our utilization percentages and our cost for all of our different clusters. And then if you want to look at it, you know, deeper than the cluster level, we get into this workloads tab where we dig into a single cluster uh, on this workloads tab. And we're going to see uh, all of our different workloads. So say we want to filter down to, you know, just deployments uh, and we want to look at a specific namespace. I don't know what the cranky Nash namespace <laughs> is, but I'm super curious now. Right. Uh, but anyway, we'll take a look. You know, we can do our, that seems like an out of generated name. That's what it is. Um, we can take a look at just our Prometheus namespace here uh, and see our, our relative total costs, our relative daily costs. Um, and then we have additional quality of services that we've defined. Um, to give you different types of recommendations. So we already talked about guaranteed and burstable, but now um, you know where where we add a little bit of value on that is we say you know maybe this is a critical workload and you want to make sure it never ever ever gets um killed. Well, let's give it a little bit extra. So we're going to bump that recommendation up by a, a certain percentage, or um, you know limited and maybe we just we don't care about this. So we just want to drop it all the way down and just let it get killed all day long. That's fine. It's not going to bother us. So. We add that on as well as, you know, what, what do we think it's going to cost to make this change? So sometimes you need to give things more resources and your costs go up and that's okay, but you maybe want to know what that's going to look like before you make that change. So we have all those recommendations here uh, in one good place. And then we can, you know, slice and dice this different ways. We've got uh, aggregating by namespace. So we can just see what different namespaces are costing us and what our recommendations are going to cost us. And then we can start to aggregate by label too. So if you have a labeling scheme, you know, you want to look at your app.kubernetes.io slash name, we can filter by that as well. Um, so just a lot more feature rich dashboard, multiple clusters, um, and then, you know, couple that with the fact that we have automation rules and all this other good stuff. There's a lot going on here. So I definitely don't have time to talk about it all, but that's what we got. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty awesome. Goldilocks um, seems like it'd be super useful. Um, certainly, I feel like one of the places where people tend to struggle with their clusters is setting uh, their resource limits and requests, um, either not doing it at all or um, you know struggling with figuring out where the sweet spot is. And so it seems like uh, Goldilocks is a, a good tool for that. Yeah. I like to think so. Uh, <laughs> we get good feedback from the community, so I hope I hope other folks find it useful as well. So. Yeah. All right. All right. I think that does it for our. I believe our so. Uh, we do have a uh, white paper that you can download about uh, Kubernetes misconfigurations. Uh, the link is here on this slide, which I will leave up for a few seconds in case folks want to write it down. Uh, and then I believe you'll get an email with a link to that as well, as well as the uh, recording here, which I think is only being sent out by email because we had technical <laughs> challenges today. So thank you all for watching and listening and, and uh, hope have a great rest of your day. Yeah. Bye, everyone.